The models in this video were made by Adam Midzuk or Kuzim on Twitter. They were animated by Cameron or Camzilla94 on Twitter. Links to their socials in the comments section below. Scotland today appears vastly different from how it did hundreds of millions of years ago. Where there's now sheep, bagpipes, alcoholism, haggis, righteous anger towards the Britbongers, and kilts, there was once continent-spanning swaths of swamps, forests, giant insects, and crocodilian amphibians. Oxygen levels were a tad higher, but it was the moisture and foliage that provided the natural canvas for the diversification in sheer size of creepy crawlies. As the climate grew drier and the continents split apart from their supercontinent phase, the giant bugs died out and the forests compressed upon themselves until their icky, grimy remains became enormous deposits of coal. Coal we use to power our machines to catapult ourselves into the environment-choking industrial revolution. Among the coal swamps of Scotland once swam a giant killer tadpole beast with diminutive legs that pushed itself along with a huge paddle-like tail to engulf its prey with a gaping maw rimmed by many rows of teeth. This critter is the tadpole from hell, the Crassigarhinus. For those interested, there's new Crassigarhinus merch in the Edge Redbubble, like stickers, shirts, and more. Links in the description and comment section below. For the longest time, this animal was known only from a single specimen. The first specimen upon which a scientist describes a new species or genus is called a holotype. A lengthy description of this tadpole-like holotype specimen was published in 1929 by David Watson but the specimen was basically just a slice of the skull locked in a block of hard ironstone. That doesn't really help anyone trying to understand the beast. At first, the creature was thought to have a super flat skull it used to wriggle around in the swamp scum, thus the name Crassicorhinus, which originally intended to mean shallow wriggler, but is now considered to translate to thick tadpole. The case of the killer tadpole would remain a bit murky, like its habitat, for many more decades. Before moving on to more recent discoveries and descriptions of the killer tadpole, we must go back in time. You see, the true story of the discovery of this animal takes us back to the 1840s and 50s when self-taught Scottish geologist Hugh Miller was digging around the old red sandstone outcrops from East Lothian to Berwickshire. All of his discoveries now lie within the Hugh Miller collection of the National Museums of Scotland. Among the remains he had found over his life were a few specimens belonging to a large stem tetrapod with a slender jaw. The slender jaw fossils would get their due in 1890 when English naturalist and geologist Richard Lydecker got a hold of them and published his description in which he named the new creature Macromerium or Macromerion scoticum. The specimen comes from the Gilmerton ironstone deposits of Gilmerton, Edinburgh. Now, you might be wondering, how come the fossil skull that was found and described later is considered the holotype specimen and not the very first specimen described back in 1890? That's because the older specimen was considered a different animal for a long time before other researchers were able to compare it to better fossils of Crassicorhinus more recently. Between Watson's description and naming of Crassicorhinus and the 1980s, the 1890 jaw had been discussed as possibly belonging to Crassicorhinus due to some similarities in the teeth and jaw structure, plus being from the same time and place. In the mid-1980s, A.L. Panchin redescribed the old jaw as well as the 1929 skull and found that there was still not enough direct evidence to combine the two. The first specimen given the name Crassigarhinus, specimen number 1859.33.104, or originally number 272, the one from 1929, and the one redescribed by Panchin in 1985, was also part of the Hugh Miller collection, which adds to the reasoning behind the possible synonymizing of the jaw with the rest of the tadpole material. 
The original material is only known to have originated from the Midlothian region, but does not come with any other relevant data on where it was found or how. Hanchen noted that it's labeled as Carboniferous Limestone and that David Watson had noted that he thought the fossils may have come from the Gilmerton Ironstone, a locality of, well, Ironstone in the neighborhood of Gilmerton, 22 kilometers southeast of Edinburgh. This chunk of ironstone is part of the Lower Limestone Group. Watson had made this identification based on the type of rock that surrounded the bones, which is a nodular ironstone made up of concretions of siderite in a hard, dark gray, shaley matrix. This rock type is rather common in the Gilmerton rocks, and since some of the Miller collection comes from this area, Watson figured this was the best guess given the evidence. Siderite is a type of carbonate mineral that has some iron in it. Sometimes siderite can form concretions, or lumps, and in the case of this fossil, the rock surrounding it is made up of these lumps, cemented together with dark gray, ultra-tiny particles of shale, or mud that's turned to rock. The iron in the siderite is why the rock type is referred to as ironstone, and it also makes it a pain in the ass to break or chip. This is one of the reasons why the study of Crassicorhinus is such a continuous work in progress. People keep coming back to the old fossils to chip more bones out. Panchin made sure to double check on the possible locality of these specimens by comparing it to known rock samples from the Gilmerton layer. He was supplied with specimens of the Lonehead Ironstone done at Shale and the Gilmerton Limestone. The matrix that holds together the rock surrounding the amphibian's fossils contains fossilized assemblages of spores. These fossil spores are of Upper Vician or Lower Namurian age, which are the chunks of geologic time from 346 to 330 and 330 to 323 million years ago, respectively. Panchin knew this, as the study of spores and pollen is quite robust, and many species have been strongly correlated with specific times. In other words, only certain species of spores occur in certain rocks. So, if you can identify the spore or the pollen, you can tag an accurate estimate of age to that rock. Panchin also noticed that the spores in the Crassicorhinus rocks resembled those that were in the samples he had from the Gilmerton layer, making the identification of the location of origin for the fossil right on the money. In Panchin's 1985 study, he describes how he found out a lot more information about Crassicorhinus thanks to the advancement in fossil preparation techniques since the 1920s. Panchin and team cleaned up the bones with air abrasive scribes beyond that which Watson had done. This made the sutures or lines between the bones visible. This also allowed Panchin to get a better understanding of where Crassicorhinus places on an evolutionary tree. World renowned for her work in tetrapod evolution, Dr. Jennifer Clack had described more remains of Crassicorhinus found since the 80s, which included much more of the animal's ribcage and limbs. It was during this time and within the next decade or so that a much more fully fleshed out image of the killer tadpole took form. It is now known from upwards of 15 specimens, varying in completeness from a single toe bone to the most complete smashed skull and bits of torso. A much newer study, published in 2018 through the Earth and Environmental Science Transactions of the Royal Society of Edinburgh by Drs. Eva Herbst and John Hutchinson, saw the team CT and micro CT scan a few specimens of Crassicorhinus to get a better idea of how the different parts of its skeleton, like ribs and legs, worked. They looked at specimens NHMUK VPR 10,000, NMS G 1985.15.1, 15.2, and 15.5, plus NMS G 1975.5.5. Remember, the matrix surrounding the bones is incredibly hard ironstone, so sending the entire thing through a CT scanner is the best way to observe each and every bone of the specimens. Herbst and Hutchinson threw the specimens in a scanner to see if there were more bones than the rocks themselves let on. This was also so that 3D models could be made of the bones for further biomechanical analyses. 
NHMUK VPR-10000 is the big specimen here. It's a huge slab of ironstone and the exploded corpse of a Crassigarinus. This specimen is the first ever found of the beast with post-cranial bones or anything behind the head. It was found in the Dora bone bed from the Namurian age of Cowdenbeath, Fife. It's also a mess because there are a ton of bones on the outside of the specimen which obscure any fossils beneath them. If they were removed, that would also remove any context for deposition of the bones and rock and could damage the fossil, hence the CT scans. The rest of the specimen used in Herbst and Hutchinson's study were also reported from the same area, with these other specimens containing the only known hind limb bones of the beast so far found. Based on the known bones found in these specimens, there are at least two individuals among the mess. What did they find? A lot of bones. Like, a ton of them. The team found some possible pleurocentrum. That may not sound like it means much, but a pleurocentra is one of the elements that made up the vertebrae of fish and some extinct amphibians. As tetrapods, or four-legged backboned animals, made the evolutionary journey onto land, the vertebrae became more and more fused together for support. A pleurocentrous vertebra would be like this. It is composed of three main parts, the tall blade on the top, the neural arch, the big parts on the bottom, the intercentra, and of course these small bits up here, the pleurocentrum. If the bony elements Herbst and Hutchinson identified in Crassigarinus are truly pleurocentrum, then it may have implications for the evolution of this animal and fill in some gaps in the story of how animals left the water but went back in. It's worth noting that these bony bits may not be pleurocentrum but have all the hallmarks of them, so are tentatively referred to as pleurocentrum. All in all, the team found chunks of vertebrae and ribs from the center of the body, plus some ribs near the end of the torso, and reanalyzed the pelvis and hind limbs and found some hand bones. What do these bones tell us about the body and life of Crassigarinus? All told, Crassigarinus was an incredibly weird animal. Its adaptations have made it particularly difficult to place in an evolutionary grouping over the years. If you take a look at its head, you'll see that this thing was pretty much all mouth. It had a short, robust skull, but a long, thin jaw. The jaws were filled with two rows of only slightly recurved, bullet-shaped tufers, with the second row containing a couple pairs of much longer, fang-like teeth, which may have helped the animal grasp onto slippery prey. This mouth could also open to an incredible 60 degrees, which may suggest it used it as a snap trap to ensnare any passing animals. An interesting part of this animal's anatomy resides in the snout. The skull shows that it had two holes, one of which connected the top of the snout to the palate. This hole is a structure similarly seen in other stem tetrapods from this time that also had large, fang-like tusks in their mouths, which acted as an exit point for these teeth, which would have been so long that they would have stabbed the animal's upper jaw and palate. A mirrored structure in the lower jaws likely helped to house the fangs of the upper jaw as well. The large and semi-rectangular eye sockets and nostrils were placed rather far forward on the skull, giving the impression of a short face. Those eye sockets also indicate large eyeballs and light-sensitive eyes, the better to see through the murky depths of its swampy habitat. Between the short skull table and the cheek was a notch. This notch has been interpreted by many researchers as the unit which housed the critter's spiracle. The spiracle, which can be seen in sharks and rays today, were used for breathing. Over time, tetrapods developed better ways to sense vibrations and the spiracle became part of the ear, which is where it remains today in most land-loving tetrapods. All the way back here in Crassigarinus, it was probably still used for breathing and probably didn't help it here. As a tetrapod, stem tetrapod, or whatever the hell it really is, it had four limbs. Four limbs that were unlike most amphibious creatures of its size. The back limbs were the largest and most powerful, potentially helping the critter to steer or cling to rocks and vegetation when at rest. 
The front limbs were barely limbs at all and were shoved up real close to the animal's jaw joint like a fish. They were so underdeveloped in appearance that they were almost certainly useless or near useless. The entire series of tail vertebrae have never been recovered, so exactly how long that tail stretched and exactly the shape of it remains a mystery. That being said, many researchers have agreed upon the speculation that it probably had an eel-like or paddle-shaped tail, flattened from side to side and expanded from top to bottom. All the better for paddling through water from meal to meal. This isn't total speculation, as its lack of strong limbs means it had to have used its tail as its primary source of propulsion. And we know it was restricted to the water from the types of rock it was found in and its nearly vestigial limbs. Now that we have somewhat of an understanding of the critter's overall anatomy, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get a better comparison of how big the damn thing was. Depending on the true length of the tail, Crassigorhinus could reach up to between 1.5 to 2 meters, 4.9 to 6.5 feet in length, making it about as big as a medium-sized alligator. The large, possibly light-sensitive eyes, small, nearly useless front legs, more powerful back legs, and wide mouth lines up pretty well with an ambush predator lifestyle. Lying in wait in the murky waters of Carboniferous Scotland until it sees its chance to strike, pushing itself with its back legs and powering itself forward with its immense tail, it would open its enormous mouth bristling with teeth and fangs to end the life of the fish and small stem tetrapods it lived with. In 2002, Jennifer Clack suggested the cheek region of the skulls and the distinctive surface ornamentation were the site for attachment of fleshy skin flaps akin to the modern Matamata turtles and Wobbegong sharks as a way to mimic the vegetation in its environment. This remains a plausible and possible speculation, but there's no definitive hard evidence to prove it one way or the other, so paleo artists can go hog wild in how they depict its soft tissues. New evidence from phylogenetic studies of other Carboniferous tetrapods has shown that Crassigorhinus is probably secondarily primitive in its anatomy. This means that it was not the last surviving member of the more primitive forms, but that its more fish-like characteristics have been secondarily acquired, since it adapted to an even more aquatic lifestyle than other early tetrapods. The more mysterious nature of Crassicorhinus is where it places evolutionarily. It is obviously on the basal end of the tetrapod family tree, but where exactly is not entirely standing on solid ground. The best we got is that it is a stem tetrapod, but that is very general. It was traditionally placed within the group Labyrinthodontia, which holds many other amphibian-like animals. Then it was considered related to the anthracosaurs, but it now remains in the stegocephalia clade left without any more specific classifications until more research is done. Crassigorhinus comes from rocks dating to the early Carboniferous period. During this time, Scotland was located near the equator, similar in position to Central Africa today. That means a hot, humid climate. Northern Carboniferous Scotland was upland area, with the south being lowlands. At this time, Scotland was connected by the northwest to North America. Over the course of the Carboniferous period, sea levels rose and fell with relative frequency, covering Scotland in shallow sea and estuary environments and retreating to form rivers and swamps. During this time, the trees we know of today didn't exist. In their place were tree-shaped club mosses, the Lycopodiales, and their relatives, the Lepidodendrales. Horsetails were everywhere and ferns covered the ground. Crassigorhinus was joined in the waterways and swamps by freshwater-adapted sea scorpions, bivalves, and brachiopods. Much larger stem tetrapods and temnospondyl amphibians patrolled the rivers and riverbanks, like the 14-foot Loxoma and 15-foot Voliderpeton. Some dragged their floppy, soggy bodies onto land for a bite, like the heavy-set Pterogerinus or the saw-toothed Anthracosaurus. On land were the giant arthropods, like giant scorpions, millipedes, and dragonflies. 
Reptiles were just getting going, with lizard-like forms such as Hylonymus. Many new forms were experimenting with high metabolisms and herbivory, like Decapterinids, Pelicosaurs, and Saurians. Unfortunately for animals like Crassigorhinus, more advanced fish and the Temnospondyl amphibians eventually replaced them, the only proof of their existence being whatever became trapped in the sandstones, ironstones, and coal deposits. And also the one Nigel Marvin tussled with on his journey to collect all the giant bugs before they became deep fried by forest fires. But that's a story for another time. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bu- Subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons, Ray, Isaiah Garza, Dinosaur, Christoph Hubbinger, Biotiverse, and Arda Bayer. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, The Dogman, Iron Bladesman, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.